Good morning, Journey family. Please join with me as we say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, good morning, officially, uh, to those of you who are here in the building and to those of you who are watching at home. Uh, welcome. Thanks for spending your Sunday worship time with us. And um, I didn't run home and do a wardrobe change, if you're watching online. That was recorded on Thursday night because of regulations that uh, keep bands from appearing in um, congregational settings. So... Uh, we are going to use this time to focus on something uh, very important. We're going to use it to focus on prayer, especially prayer for our country uh, and, and for our response as a church to the things that are going on right now in our country. So we have three prayer points that we're going to be praying over. But before we go into that, we're just going to spend some time uh, preparing our hearts for prayer. Uh, one of the ways that I prepare my heart for prayer is to look at Psalm 131. It says, My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me but I have stilled and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we have three, three prayer points that we're going to be looking at. And you'll see them up on the screen so you can focus on them. The first prayer point is the healing of the soul of our nation. And uh, we are going to have uh, Anne come up and... Uh, after we do some time of reflection in the music, Anne's going to come up and pray for the restoration of clear thinking, peaceful discussion and disagreement, compassion and respect beyond our differences. And before we do that, I'm going to ask that you hum along with me as we hum a song we've done here quite a bit. Bless the Lord, my soul. Psalm 127 reminds us that unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. 
Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. our hearts for things. God prepared my heart to pray this, and he's been working on it for three years because I walk dogs for a living, so I don't see a lot of Christians. I see a lot of people that aren't, and um, I used to walk past them and just continue to pray because that's what I do when I walk dogs, and one day the Lord told me to shut up and start to listen, so I engaged with people that weren't like me. And you know something? They really aren't like me. They have the same desires for their families, the same desires for our nation. They are so much like me. I had to repent of where my heart was because my heart was hard and harsh and judgmental because they didn't come to church and they didn't love the Lord. But they love attributes and aspects of God that I have yet to begin, begin to grasp. So God has prepared my heart. We need clear thinking. We need to be, be respectful because that's what he's called us to do. So right now, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for the ways that we don't listen, that we don't listen to you first, that we don't listen to our neighbors that our thoughts are confused and clouded by what we think we know and who we think you are because you're greater than what we think and you're bigger than what we know. So right now we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your forgiveness as a church that we haven't been available, that we have been judgmental. We repent right now. We ask that you would soften our hearts, that you would help us be a part of the solution and not continue to be part of the problem. Excuse me, this is hard. That when people did come at us with different viewpoints, Lord, that we would respectfully listen to them. Um, Lord, that we wouldn't interject our own thoughts and feelings, but we would understand that they come from a place, they've had a life, they've done things, they've said things, they believe things because that's where their life has taken them. Lord, we ask that you would help us, Father, to, to hear your heart, to hear, to hear what you want us to say in return. The life that we need to live openly, Lord, is a life without judgment because we're not called to judge. We're called to love. We're called to, to extend hands out to our brothers and sisters and to bring them alongside of us so we can bring them alongside of you. Our whole purpose to be on this planet is to make disciples for you, to show your love and your mercy and your justice and everything that you are to people who don't believe in you. Lord, deepen our understanding of who you are, and deepen our compassion, and, and our, our heart of love for those that we don't know, that, that 
we don't think we have anything in common with because we do have more in common with them, Lord, than we have given them credit for or we've given ourselves credit for. And I'm sorry I'm not praying well. I just, my heart has been so broken this week over what we've done to ourselves. We repent of that, Father God. We repent of that. Heal our nation. Let us be broken and humble and contrite because you are with the broken and the humble and the contrite. It has nothing to do with standing with our fists raised in defiance of what's going on in the political portion of this country and everything to do with being on our knees with our hands outstretched to what you want. And we thank you for that, and we bless you and praise you for that. Our second prayer point is the repentance of the U.S. Church. after a few moments of uh, musical reflection. George Rhodes is going to come up and lead us in prayer, point, uh, gearing towards uh, tearing down political idols that we substitute for the gospel and following Jesus. Turning from the hatred of others and turning towards love, especially love of enemies. And turning to the Lord's rule in our life and the rule of Christ in our hearts. And uh, to pray a prayer for this and have us hum in Christ alone. Reflecting on this prayer point, uh, God pointed me right to Psalm 126, uh, a great psalm for, for anybody who needs to come back from something horrible. It said, when, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations that the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to lift up the churches here in the United States and in, included in that is our own 
Church, Journey Community Church. Lord, there are many that are in the churches, Heavenly Father, that have allowed political and social issues to come in between you and them, and they have made idols of them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would forgive us for this horrid sin of putting something before you. That people's hearts and minds would be turned back to you and cast these idols away and put you first in their life. I pray, Heavenly Father, for our brothers and sisters across this nation, those who love and serve and worship you. I pray you would give them strength and patience. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give them wisdom and understanding to know what to cast aside and, and uh, Lord, to then cling to your word, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a forgiving God. If only we will come and bow before you. Lord, I pray that our attitudes would be attitudes of love. Your great commandment, Jesus, was that we must love God with all of our mind and heart and soul. And second to that was to love our neighbors. To love the unloved, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would allow us to do that, that you would give us strength, those we disagree with, that you would give us strength to love them, to witness to them, to be an example to them, Lord, by how we live, that our lives would reflect you and not our own sinful self. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, for not reflecting you, but reflecting our own self. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would turn our hearts to you, that our hearts would desire to worship you every day, no matter what the circumstance is in, and hold to the promise that you, God, are in control over all things. Thank you, Heavenly Father, and again, I pray that you would forgive us for our sins, for our weaknesses, cast aside our own desires and attitudes, cleanse our hearts, Heavenly Father, that we can return to you and serve you and serve as we should as an example to our nation. So I pray this for all churches in this nation, Lord. Amen. So our third and final prayer point is fulfilling our God-given task. And uh, after the next uh, bit of reflection, Kaisa Anderson's going to come up and pray. She's going to ask the Lord to empower his church to make peace between enemies. That the Lord would empower his church to share the gospel and make disciples. And that the Lord would empower his church to heal. And in reflecting on this, I really began to think about unity 
And when I think of unity, I think of one of the more overly descriptive psalms, Psalm 133. It says, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard. Running down on Aaron's beard upon the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So as we reflect, let's think about accepting the blessings that God has for us. as a church and individually. And we'll hum the doxology. I see here. Um, so if you would pray with me. Lord, thank you so much for the fact that we can gather together here um, and that uh, we can be together in fellowship with one another. And I was reading in Acts this morning about the early church and how the company of believers gathered together and broke bread together in prayer and in unity, and that you added to their numbers daily, God. Um, I ask, Father, that you would um, show us how we can love others and speak to them about knowing the author of life, God. I pray um, for us in the church uh, that in conversation, God, we would look to you as the author of life, as Jesus who sits on the throne, Father, that we would trust and remember that uh, in spite of everything, God, we love you. Father, I pray that you would bring us together in your name and that that would be a testimony, Lord, to our neighbors, to our families. Father, that we would look to you as the, the author of life and the king. Um, and I also just have thought a lot about uh, the Israelites and how they were asking for a king. And you, Father, reminded them that you had been their provider and their deliverer, God, and had given them everything they needed. And so I pray, Father, that we would look to you as our provider and our deliverer, and that peace and that trust would also be a testimony. Father, people would, would wonder how is it that can, you can remain so peaceful in the midst of everything? God, and we would be able to share where our peace comes from, Father. I also um, thank you that um, so many of us are able to give to others who are in need. 
But I also pray that um, when we don't have maybe physical um, um, needs that we can meet, Father, that we would speak to those um, who are in need and say, um, we may not be able to give you money, but what we can give you, um, we, um, we bring in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would show us how to bring healing um, to the hearts and the souls of those around us, God, and you would be speaking to us um, about those who are in need in that way. Once again, we just thank you so much that we can be here together, Father, um, looking to you on the throne um, in unity. In Jesus' name, amen. So we got to talk about Wednesday. Um, I just hold it. So we last year uh, we were like a lot of churches on hiatus because of the the virus, right? And we were for a few months we were solely online. And, uh, and connecting that way in small groups and things like that. That's just how we were doing stuff, like a lot of people. And we came back together. And when we came back together, it was the first thing we had to do. We had to talk about the fact that the world was on fire, right? And we had protests in our nation uh, over the death of George Floyd, but really it's about a lot of other stuff we got some national family issues that we're working through right now. And we're not working through them very well. And we don't seem to be able to stop setting things on fire and hurting people and killing people to work through them. So we talked about that because we acknowledge that we as a church are politically diverse. We're we're all over the place. I mean, this church, you could argue in a lot of ways, is probably, like a lot of churches, a microcosm of the nation. We, We are all over the place, and we can afford to be all over the place at least we hope we can because we follow Jesus. So we, we can, hopefully we can afford to be all over the political spectrum because there's the cross of Christ, and his cross is a lot more great than our cross, but we got ours symbolically up because we are symbolizing the cross of Christ, the God-man dying for the sins of the world and bringing us back together with God, bringing us back together with one another. Hopefully that's enough to keep us together. And, and to be able to uh, even leverage our diversity uh, politically, ideologically. But we, we're, we have that kind of going, th- unity happening, and lots of other churches do, too. But we came back together last year, and we had talked about the fact that the world was on fire. So we've been off for a few weeks this time, and now we've come back together, and we got to talk about the fact that the world's on fire or at least our neck of the woods in the world, I should say, is on fire, because there's other parts of the world that aren't on fire. I'm sure they're doing well in Finland right now. Um, But uh, we're not in Finland. We're here. And, uh, yeah, we've had uh, some folks, some folks, not all, not all, but some folks uh, have uh, stormed a Capitol building on Wednesday, uh, in an attempt to uh, disrupt our political process, our election process, um, 
There were protests that did not involve storming anything. And to be fair, that's true. Just like last summer, we had to be fair and say there were protests that did not involve violence. And that was true. Uh, and this time, there, there were protests that did not involve violence, but were people who were very angry about the election results and what they deemed to be uh, irregularities or just flat out a stolen election, right? And this form of injustice, just like in the summer, we had people who, have, who were protesting because, among other things, protesting over police injustice. And what's been fascinating to watch as this has played out this week, I, my, my mind has just been filled with this in the same way that uh, the riots last summer, it just kind of dominated my thoughts. It was tough to think at times, and I'm sure that was true for some of you. I've talked to people, and they say, yeah, just really tough to think. You know, to put all this together, just like go about and like eat your Cheerios and, you know, be with your kids as <laughs> they take online classes. It, you know, and then you got COVID. It, it, just been, it adds to the fuzziness, to the static, to be able to comprehend all this. But one thing that's been fascinating to see, and if you want a picture of the polarization uh, of our nation over all this, is that you have people who this past summer were cheering on the, the riots and protests who now are shocked and clutching their pearls about what happened at the Capitol building. I mean, just shocked. It's kind of like, hey, you don't see the relationship here? And then there are other people who, who called for law and order last summer. Law and order. Shoot the looters. And right now, you know, this, this, this is entirely justified and we need to take our nation back or something like that. Different people engaged in the exact same activities with the same base emotions, even and who can't see that they're, you know, they're, they're engaging in the same kind of action just for different motives. It's the same thing. And that gives you a picture of how divided we are as a nation. And so we got to talk about Wednesday, but really Wednesday is an ex just an extension of this past summer. Right? It, it's all the same thing. It's two sides of the same coin. It really is. And it, it, if you're going to wrap your mind about, around what's happening right now, you have to start there. It's two sides of the same coin. Right? And the process of this, I, I want to just go to Scripture and, and take us to an unlikely passage, a passage that, that if, if someone t asked you, if someone said, how in the world are you going to like get the word of God and, and look at that as the interpretive lens, like look through the word of God as the interpretive lens for all the chaos we see right now. I'm going to take you to a passage you probably wouldn't run to, that I probably wouldn't have run to if it were not for the fact that I got this Bible reading, like read the Bible in a year program, right? A lot of you have this, or you've been through something like this, and I, I, got, I got a new one uh, this year, and, and, and I just happened to be in a certain passage, and I was looking at it going, oh! Whoa, I never would have thought about that. So that, that's why we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 20 today. That's it. It's just because it it all this happened to fall at the exact same time that I, I was looking at this, at this bit and saw some striking parallels to what we're looking at. So we're going to look at Genesis 20 together today. I'm going to just pray real quick. I know I kind of launched into things that didn't pray, but let me go ahead on and we're going to ask the Lord to be with us. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, uh, we need you. We need you as a church. We need you as a nation. Uh, we really don't have much going on without you. And um, sometimes we know that. Sometimes we don't. And I pray, God, that we would know that right now as a congregation, that our nation would come to know that deep in our bones, that we need the living God. We need the living God to stick together. We need the living God in Christ Jesus. We need the gospel of Christ Jesus to be able to hold this thing together. And we definitely need you to hold us together as, as a church, as people, as families. Lord, we need your word. And we pray that you give us a word from you. And that you'd speak powerfully into our life situation, but particularly this cultural moment in our response to it. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we lift this up. Amen. Genesis chapter 20. I'm going to read it in bits so we can get our mind around it. Genesis 20. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version of Scripture. 
From there, Abraham journeyed toward the, ter the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. And he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you're a dead man. Because the woman of whom you've taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? But he didn't say, but he himself did say to me, she is my sister. And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands, I've done this. And the Lord said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you've done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. And let's stop right there. What's happening here? Well, clearly we're in, in the narrative of Abraham's life. And what's just happened is Sodom and Gomorrah have just been destroyed. Right? And Abraham, you read his narrative, he's always on the move. He's always on the move. God showed him, God called Abraham in, in uh, what we now call uh, Iraq, in Ur of the Chaldees. And he told Abraham, hey, you, I'm going to make your name great, and we're going to hit the reset button on humanity, and we're going to go through you and your family, and I'm going to bless all the families of the earth, and I'm going to give you this land. He, he progressively begins to reveal more of this plan to Abraham. I got, I got a bit of land I'm going to give you. I got some real estate I'm going to give to you. It's going to be yours one day. Not yet, but one day. And Abraham just travels all around this land, and he ends up in these in, in these situations, and he ends up coming to know the living God deeper and deeper as he travels with him. And now he's in this place called Gerar. There's a king, there's a guy named uh, Abimelech, or really it's Abimelech, and his name means something like, uh, my father is the king, or the king is my father, right? So it's really a title. It's not really of so much a name as it is a title. Right, And the tradition among these people, and, you, and you've seen this happen before with Abraham. You saw this in Genesis 13. There was a tradition among certain ancient Near Eastern people that, hey, they could, if, if they just rolled up on some family, right, and, and, there, and there was a woman in the family, and they thought she was real pretty, they could just take her and add her to their harem. They had harems back then, right, and, and, and add her just to their harem. They could just take them. And Abraham knew this. So that's why Abraham says to, to Sarah, look, if they know that I'm your husband, they're going to look at you and they're going to kill me. So just, let's just say that we're brother and sister, which actually is half true. And then they won't hurt me. Right? And that's what's happening here. So, so Abimelech takes her. Right? And, and Abraham lies. And then God has to clean up his mess. Again, this is the second time he's done this. Read Genesis 13. Does the same thing in Egypt. And God has to clean up his mess. And God tells Abimelech, no, sir. No, sir. Not going to work. Not, not her. No way. They're special. This is not going to work. And, of course, Abimelech didn't even know what was going on. And God tells him, I, I know, I know you didn't know. I know you didn't know. But she's special and he's a prophet. No. Don't do it. And if you don't return her, you're going to die and everybody who belongs to you is going to die. You are a dead man. Not exactly a way to be in the world and not of it, if you're Abraham. Right. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called to Abraham and said to him, 
What have I done to you? Well, what have you done to us? Excuse me. And how have I sinned against you that you've brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You've done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you see that you did this thing? Abraham said, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Hang on to that verse. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do to me at every place to which we come. Say of me, he is my brother. See that? Back to that verse 11. That's the key to our passage. Abraham said, I did this. I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. That's our passage. That's our passage. Right? Why does Abraham do this? He lies. He lies. And not only that. God has already gotten him out of, out of many hairy situations. God already had to play cleanup when he did this exact same thing previously in Egypt. The exact thing. Right? Why does he do this? He does it because he's blind. He's blind to the impact his recklessness is going to have on his family. He's already disrupted his family once. God told him, you're going to have a kid. You guys are older. You and Sarah are older, but you're going to have a kid. And, you know, they kind of got itchy and were kind of waiting for God to do stuff. And God didn't work in the timeline. So what did Abraham do? They cooked up this plan. It's like, okay, you got a concubine. Her name's Hagar. Go ahead and have sex with Hagar. And we're going to bring about this whole miracle thing. Bad plan. It did not end well. Right? Already put the family in danger before. Doing it again. Puts his wife up for sale to a guy who's building a harem. And his role as a husband's compromised. He's supposed to protect his wife. But here, he's protecting himself. He knew that people might take her and kill him. That, that at least was the fear. So he's looking out for his own life. He's blind to the impact the recklessness will have on his family. He's also blind to the impact his recklessness will have on this host culture, on Abimelech and Abimelech's people. God approaches him in verse 3. You are a dead man. In other words, I'm going to kill you. Right? You are a dead man. And he, he didn't, he was just like, hey, I'm just, what what I do? I didn't know. That's just some lady. Real pretty lady. But a lady, just some lady. Right? And even later, you see the impact if you keep reading. Verse 14, then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah, he said, behold, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It's a sign for your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone, uh, you are vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and also healed his wife and female slaves so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. The narrator intentionally leaves that one at the end. What God had done, basically, is he made it so nobody could have babies. Because God's point was, I want to, look, the miracle baby, who's going to be Isaac, has to come through Abraham and Sarah. Right? And I want to make sure that the only way that baby comes about while they're living in this land is through Abraham and Sarah. Because Abraham lied. And also, God knew Abraham pretty well and knew Abraham had tried plan B with another woman before. 
And so God had to be sure. He's saying, I'm going to make sure that Abraham can't do another plan B or C or D. So nobody's going to have babies. That's what, that's what this results in in the culture, this host culture. Abraham's stinking up the joint. Lastly, he's blind to the impact his recklessness will have on God's larger purposes. God did it once. Abraham, excuse me, did this once before. God had to clean up his mess. And just like in the previous instance, God, Abraham jeopardizes the promise. What's God's promise? Genesis 12, 2 through 3. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. Make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And, and, to, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But that's not happening now, is it? Abraham's family is not blessed right now. And that's because of him. Abimelech and his people are not blessed right now. And Abraham has forgotten that he is blessed. He's forgotten that God has blessed, God's the one that blesses him, and he's forgotten why he's blessed. This is messed up. Abraham's blind. I said blind. Blinded by what? He's blind to his recklessness and the impact it has on his family, this culture, this host culture he's in, and also God's promises. What's he blinded by? Verse 11, I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Notice how Abraham shifts the blame. He justifies himself by saying, well, you guys don't fear God, and I thought that you godless folk were going to do some terrible things to me and my family, so I simply had to take this course of action. And if you're having trouble connecting the dots here and, and, and understanding the, the context, let's put it like this. I did it because I thought there is no fear of God in you progressives. So I had to storm the Capitol building. For the other side, too, I thought there is no appreciation for justice among you conservatives. So we had to riot and loot and burn down a city. See? He's blinded by fear. Fear. It's funny, the irony. He did it because he, of, of Abimelech's lack of fear of God, but he's afraid. He's focused on Abimelech's lack of fear of God. And it's like, Abraham, you don't really fear God a whole lot yourself right by now. He's afraid. And we could rework this for Abraham. Let's help him out a little bit. I let my fear of man compromise my faith in God. See that? It's a little better. I let my fear of man compromise my faith in and God, it all boils down to fear versus faith. I let my fear of man compromise my faith in God. See? There are many Christians, many of us, who are working through the events from Wednesday, and we're still really working through the events from last summer. Because to me, it's, I, I'll say again, it's two sides of the same coin. I don't separate them. Many people are working real hard to separate them. Yeah, but, 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 but mine's justified. No, it's not. It's really not. If somebody burned down businesses because of so-called justice, it was wrong and goofy. If somebody contributed to the death of the four people who died on Wednesday and property damage and terrorizing folk at the Capitol building or anywhere else, it's wrong and goofy. And it's godless, even if you want to put Jesus' name in it. The Lord owns his name. He owns the copyright on his name. Many people were th throwing God's name around bo both sides. This past summer, people taking Jesus' name. I'm going, are you, you serious? You better cool that stuff. Don't pimp his name. People are not being driven by Jesus for this stuff. People are not being driven by faith. This is, this is fear. It's 
fear. Stark raving fear. Just like Abraham, fear. I did it because there is no fear of God at all in this place. And they'll kill me because of my wife. He's afraid. Many people are living in fear right now. It's four manifestations. Well, I'll I'll pinpoint for it. There's many more. Sorry. They're afraid that our most recent election was rigged and stolen. They're afraid of the newly elected administration, the kinds of policies they will enact. They're afraid that nobody, especially in government, is looking out for their interests. They're afraid of the direction that our nation and culture have taken. What's funny is you could say the same thing about people on the other side, (laughs) about the outgoing administration. (laughs) And I got my own critiques of government I got my own critiques of political leaders, some of them, not all of them. I got my own concerns about the direction of our nation, just like you. That, that's not evil. It's not ungodly, right? But friends, watchfulness and discernment concerning pressing realities can be appropriate and can be godly. It really can. But we can't be ruled by fear. We, we, can't, we can't do it. Fear can't run the show. Not if you follow Jesus. Now, if you don't, I get it. If somebody doesn't follow the Lord, I, I totally get why fear is running the show. And the, re, the big, big underlying reason why fear is running the show in this particular cultural moment is very simple. It's because we have become religious about our politics and political about our religion. There are, what's funny to me, if you listen to some, there are some secular folk, some folk who are not religious, some of whom are out and out atheists, and they are pointing this out. It's fascinating to watch this. It's fascinating to watch this, to watch some, some, some non-believing people, not just people non-believers with respect to Christianity, non-believers with respect to anything spiritual, and they are saying this too. They've been calling this out for some time. They've been saying this is because of the decline in religion in the West, and now p- politics has filled the vacuum. I understand that. We've become very religious about our politics and very political about our religion. And I understand that, but here's the thing. For Christians, I don't understand that. I don't understand that for our tribe. It doesn't make any sense. Fear, we cannot be ruled by fear over the election, direction of our culture and nation or what the new administration will usher in, whether somebody will properly represent our interests. We can't be in the grip of fear. We're not allowed to do that because we follow Jesus. It, it doesn't work. And, and, and if we do that, what's going to happen is we're going to become religious about politics, political about religion, and then we start taking God's name and doing crazy stuff, dragging his name into all kinds of things, It's one thing to say that the gospel informs my politics. It does, and it should. That's right. Okay, there's zero wrong with that. That's right. I'll even argue that's biblical. But it's another thing to say that the gospel cannot be indistinguishable from my politics. That's idolatry. And when we we play that game, we become blind to God's larger purposes for us in the same way that Abraham became blind to God's larger purposes for him. He's compromising what God wants to do for the entire world through him. It's being compromised in one moment. What he is doing right now is he is putting putting God's purposes for the world, which, by the way, are going to end in Christ. What it would happen to Abraham centuries ago. The end point of that was Jesus. He's putting God's larger purposes for the world. I will bless through you all the families of the earth. In the New Testament, that's why you have Jesus and Paul the Apostle calling people who follow Jesus. What? Children of Abraham. 
That's why. And he has no idea what he's doing, but he's putting all those wonderful promises up on an altar right now because he's afraid. Because he's afraid of Abimelech and what he thought Abimelech would do. Abimelech didn't even get around to doing it. And as a church, what's very easy for us to do right about now is to take our wonderful purposes, our cause, the cause of Christ, to see a world redeemed and brought one back from darkness and idolatry and evil and sin and hell and death and win that world to Christ. That's a big purpose. That's the most glorious purpose. And he's laid it on us. Will we lay it on an altar for fear because we're afraid? Even if we're right, even if every conspiracy theory is right, all right, even if they're all proved right, if you could turn on a magic light switch and be like, oh, the QAnon people had it right. Oh. By the way, it's not going to happen. Let's, let's just get that straight. It's not going to happen. But if it happened, hypothetically, Right? Every conspiracy theory, you know, uh, they really didn't land on the moon. It was all staged in the studio. Right? The JFK, whatever else you want to name, 9 11, it's a conspiracy for everything. Right? Pick it. Let's say they all end up being right. And we, we, our fear is still not excused. Our fear is still not excuse. Many people think, well, if I'm right, it's okay. That's, that's, how, that's Abraham's thinking in this moment. Abraham's a great guy. <laughs> this is just one moment in his life. But in this particular moment, Abraham's like, oh, I, I, I don't have to believe God because I'm afraid of this guy. And many, many of us, it could be very easy to succumb to that thinking and say, I don't have to really trust the Lord. Because I'm afraid of what the other side is going to do politically. I don't have to trust him. I can just play politics. And I could put a Jesus sticker on my politics. I could put a cross on my politics. People have been doing it. People did it last summer. I watched people do it last summer. I couldn't believe it, the things people were put, attaching Jesus' name to. In the name of something called Justice. And I'm watching people do it again. It's happening right now. Two sides of the same coin. If you see no relationship between this past summer and, and, and what happened this week, and really all the things that have been brewing, because this week didn't, like come out of, didn't come out of clear blue sky. It's just been brewing for a while. That's a hot mess that's been brewing for, for some years now. If you don't, you don't see the similarity, you got to look closely. Everybody's pointing fingers at each other. And nobody's got clean hands. Nobody's got clean hands. Friends, if we are going to uh, live the way the Lord wants us to live, we have got to be ruled by faith and not fear. We have got to be ruled by faith and not fear. We have got to cherish God's larger purposes for us over and above what we see our culture doing. If we can do that, then here's what can happen. We can listen to the other side. It's important to listen to people who disagree, even people who, who just totally disagree with you. It's important to listen. I failed to do this before. I, I'm still a work in progress on this. There are issues that I, I am just like, I'm like, look, don't play with me. I have those issues. I look at somebody, don't play with me. Right? And I got to listen to the Holy Spirit and say, just admire and cool down. Because who cares if you win the argument if you lost the person? Who cares? Who cares? If, if we hold on to the cause of Christ tightly and everything else more loosely, we can ask more questions. 
I had a friend of mine, he, he, he said something recently I thought was brilliant. He said, a cool life hack for avoiding anger is to stay curious. You can keep conviction while still wanting to ask questions. Some people say ask questions because they're really fuzzy on their convictions. I, I don't like that. That's manipulation. You could go in with strong convictions and ask people questions and really listen and not just ask until it's your turn to talk. <laughs> listen to be heard, but listen to understand. If we will hold on to the cause of Christ, his larger purposes, we can love our enemies. There are enemies of the church. Some of them are in the political realm. Some of them, they, their politics play out, the, the way their politics play out is exactly what they want. They, their politics play out as hostile to the church. It's no coincidence because they're hostile to the church. Yes. Yes, there's legislation I look at some time and I'm like, yeah, that's aimed at God's people. Yup or doodle. Yup. That's exactly what that's about. And guess what? Still called to love. That's hard. And so what? It, it could be hard and God will understand if we struggle through and if we muddle through. But we got to love our enemies. If we will hold, if we will hold tightly to, to our cause, the cause of Christ, we can afford to love our enemies. It becomes affordable. Because we keep looking at that cross and we remember there's a time where we were God's enemies. And he sent the God man his best for us. And he's only asking a little bit of Myron Crockett that, that I can love enemies across the political divide or the ideological divide or the spiritual divide. Or any other kind of divide. If we will hold to the cross of Christ, and we will hold to the cause of Christ, excuse me, the Lord will be able to work in our lives and make us effective, and we will not become a curse to our culture, but a blessing. Abraham cursed his culture inadvertently. Right? If we hold to Christ's cause, to Christ's effort to redeem this world through his church by the power of the gospel, then we can bless this world. Bless does not mean excuse its nonsense, its darkness, its sin, its wickedness, its stupidity. Bless does not mean don't call out the world and say, hey, come out of the chaos. And come into the kingdom. No. Bless just means to renew the world in the way that the Lord is calling us to. That's not always perfect. In fact, it's usually pretty doggone messy. But the Lord will do it if we would cling to the cause of Christ. Friends, if you are gripped by fear, the same kind of fear that gripped Abraham, he is in the midst of an ungodly culture, and it terrified him, and it made him ungodly. In one moment, Abraham became ungodly. He was so concerned and so fixated on the ungodliness of the culture that he used it to, to excuse his own ungodliness, his own lack of faith. If that's you, and it could be all of us at different points in times, it's been me. Remember that we are called to a far more glorious cause. Far more glorious than what politics can offer. Right? Than what ideologies can offer. We are called to eternal things and to actualize eternal things right now. We cannot be ruled by fear. There's an ancient story, and, uh, and it to the point where nobody even knows who was the original author of the story. And there's a guy, he was driving to a city, and he was stopped by an old woman who had asked him for a ride. And he took her, took her into his vehicle, and as they drove along, he looked at her, and he, he got really scared. He was frightened. And he said, who are you? And the old woman said, I am cholera. 
the disease that killed lots and lots of people way back. I am cholera. Well, the man ordered the old woman to get down and walk. But she persuaded him to take her along because she promised him that she would not kill any more than five people in the city. Just five. And to show her, him that she was really legit and that she was going to keep her word, she gave him a dagger. And she said to him that the dagger was the only weapon that could kill her. And then she said this. She said, I'll meet you in two days. And if I break my promise, then you can stab me with the dagger. So in the city, 120 people died of cholera. And the guy, the driver, he was enraged. Enraged. And he went out to look for the old woman. And he found her. And he saw her and he raised that dagger and he was going to kill her. And she stopped him and she said, I kept my agreement. I only killed five. Fear killed all the rest. Friends, faith in God, not fear. Faith in God, not compromise. Faith in God, not hatred. Faith in God, not violence. Faith in God, not conspiracies. Because if not, fear will kill the American church. Fear of faith, the choice is ours. Thank you. Why don't we all stand and hum in response? Friends, let's be blessed. Lord God, the name of Jesus, uh, you have blessed your people to be a blessing and not a curse. You have blessed us in Christ. We all know your hand. In the name of Jesus, I pray a blessing to everybody here, every household, every family. Pray blessings upon our church, not so that we can hoard those blessings and live in fear and do what we want, but blessings upon us, Lord, so that we might be a blessing to this world. In the name of Jesus, Lord, bless us in that way, for that reason, for your cause, and help us to walk in faith and not fear. Pray that for all of us here, blessings upon you, receive it in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen.